Well, this evening I want to preach on an Old Testament character that maybe you've never heard a message about her. And so I will do my best to bring you along as we read from Joshua chapter 2 and we learn tonight about a woman by the name of Rahab. Joshua chapter 2 and verse number 1, the Bible says, And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went, and they came into an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them, and said thus, There came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. And it came to pass about the time of the shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. Whither the men went, I what not. Pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them with the stalks of flax which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way to Jordan under the fords. And as soon as they which pursued after them were gone out, they shut, up, they shut the gate. And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side, Jordan, Sihon, and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that ye will show kindness unto my father's house, and give me a true token, and that ye will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. And the men answered her, Our, li our life for yours." If ye utter not this our business, and it shall be when the Lord hath given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. And in these 14 verses that we've read, we've been given an introduction and really the majority of what you find in the Bible about a woman named Rahab. A woman who was a very unlikely woman to be lifted up in the pages of Scripture not only in the Old Testament, but also in the New, as we'll find before the message is over. But I think Rahab is a wonderful illustration of how God can take a person from rags to riches. Have you ever heard that term before, somebody that's taken from rags to riches? I remember years ago I was reading the Charlotte Observer, uh, one of the larger papers in the area, and at this time that the article was written, North Carolina did not have a lottery. Now, unfortunately, North Carolina has a lottery. It's a tax on the poor. It's a waste of time and money. Uh, I wish I could have every second back that I have stood in a convenience store waiting to check out while somebody is buying lottery tickets. It takes forever. And I want to say, if you put your money to good use, you could give it to the Lord's work instead of just casting it to the wind. But anyway... Um, this couple in Charlotte, North Carolina had crossed the border into South Carolina to play the, the South Carolina Education Lottery. Now it's really interesting, North Carolina instituted the same. They call it an education lottery and they make it sound like it's really doing a great work. But the truth is there is no more being spent on education in North Carolina today as far as, now maybe more in dollars, and that's because inflation is coming in time, but there's really no percentage-wise any greater investment on education. It's a big shell game just to get legalized gambling into our state. 
But they were playing the South Carolina Education Lottery and they won about $60 million. This was in the headlines of the Charlotte Observer. So in reality, that means the federal government won about half of it. You know, they have to pay taxes. But in that article, it highlighted this couple and it talked about how they'd been taken from rags to riches. They'd been taken from obscurity to now a place of being known. They were taken from a place where they didn't have much and now they have a lot, and it was, they were said to have been taken from rags to riches. Well, while that may be true of a physical monetary sort, I want you to understand something tonight. The person who has truly been taken from rags to riches is the person to whom God reaches down and saves their soul and changes their life. That's a person who's been taken from rags to riches. And in Joshua chapter 2, we find a woman who was taken from rags to riches. A woman who was taken from a sinful lifestyle and before it's over with in the Bible, you find her in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And so to help you understand Rahab tonight, I want you to see several things about her life. And so we've got a lot to cover and little time to do it. So I want you to listen quickly. The first thing that I want you to see this evening about Rahab is I want you to see her conversion. I want you to see that in Joshua chapter 2, this is where we find that Rahab, I believe, places her faith in God. Now, if I asked you the question tonight, I said, you, asked, you tell me, was Rahab a saved individual? Was Rahab a child of God? And reading the brief description in Joshua chapter 2, many people would be inclined to say, uh-uh. And the reason they would say that is because in the very first verse, it's, it talks about Rahab's occupation. She was an immoral lady. And yes, indeed she was, but that wasn't the rest of the story because I think in Joshua chapter 2, we find this woman at a very pivotal point in her life where she is about to go from a life of sinfulness to placing her faith in Jehovah God. Now, some of you might argue with me and you say, well, I just, I'll be honest, I just don't think that you know, Rahab was really a child of God. Well, I'll take exception with you for two reasons. Number one, because Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 31, which is the hall of faith, Rahab is mentioned in it. In Hebrews 11 and verse 31, the Bible says, By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. Now, if you're here and you say, Well, I'm going to just tell you, that I don't, I don't know that I can really say that this woman became a child of God. Well, then at least be honest enough to admit she's the only unsaved person lauded in Hebrews chapter 11. No, the reality is, is this is what set Rahab apart. She believed while all those who perished believe not. Now, there are two kinds of people in this room tonight. Some of you say tall and short. Skinny people and people who wish they were skinny. No, I'm going to tell you, there's two types of people in this room tonight. Here they are, those who believe and those who believe not. The Bible says, He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. And in this particular situation, this room is just like Rahab's day. It's filled with people who believe and those who believe not. And as we learn through Rahab's life tonight, I want you to understand nothing will transform your life than placing your faith, more than placing your faith in God. And expressly, I want to say tonight, placing your faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only way of conversion. Some people say, well, conversion is being baptized. Conversion is going to church. No, conversion is placing your faith in Jesus Christ. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Another verse that, lends me to, that teaches me very clearly that she becomes a child of God is James chapter 2 and verse 25 when the Bible says, Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and sent them out another way. Now you hear that and you say, Well, justified by works, 
Uh, does that mean that she was saved by her works? When you read the context of the book of James, James does not teach a salvation by works, but he does teach a salvation that works. Talks about faith without works is dead. What was James talking about in James chapter 2? I believe he was showing that this action in Rahab's life was a display of her faith that she had placed in God. And so we find here was a lady who was an immoral woman. She was in a pagan society. Somehow she turns to God. Here was a lady who didn't have very much background. She didn't have perhaps a lot of the amenities that we do today in hearing the Bible preached. But yet what she did hear about God when she heard that God had defeated His enemies like Sihon and Og and that He had parted the Red Sea. She knew that He was the true and the living God and she placed her faith in Him. But before I move on from her conversion, I want to remind you of something that Jesus told the religious crowd of His day. In Matthew 21 and verse 31, Jesus said to the religious crowd, He said, Verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. Jesus was talking very sternly to the religious crowd. And he said, let me tell you the difference between you, the religious crowd, and those who are publicans and harlots, those who are the outcasts of society. He said, here's the difference. They're a lot more likely to believe than you. The publicans and the harlots know that they're sinners. They know that they're apart from God and the religious crowd can't see beyond their nose. And sometimes the greatest obstacle to a person trusting Christ as their Savior is their refusal to see their own lost condition. They are content in their religious ways, but what they fail to understand is that their righteousnesses are as filthy rags, the Bible says. And so we begin learning about Rahab tonight, finding here was a woman who placed her faith in God. My question is, have you? It's a great lesson to learn. But not only do you see her conversion, the second thing that I want to show you tonight about Rahab is number two, her challenge. You know, if I'd have told Pastor Dietrich, now on Tuesday night I'm going to preach about a Bible character that is sure to challenge everybody, I want you to guess who it is. If Pastor had opened up the floor and said, all right, next Tuesday night Brother Bill's going to preach about somebody in the Bible, and they're going to be a great challenge to us, who could it be? Somebody might raise their hand, so I think it's going to be Moses. I mean, after all, there's not a man so meek in all the earth. And somebody else says, no, I don't think it's going to be Moses. I think it's going to be David. I mean, he wrote most of the, he wrote a lot of Psalms and he was the king of Israel. Somebody else might say, oh, no, 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 I think it's Paul. I mean, he's like the greatest Christian in the New Testament. And then surely there'd be one spiritual person in here. You'd rate and say, no, I think it's going to be on Jesus because He is the Son of God. But I don't think anybody in this room would have raised their hand and said, well, I know who it's going to be. It's going to be Rahab. Because most of the time when people think about Rahab, they think about her past. They think about her occupation that's mentioned in Joshua chapter 2. But do you know that Rahab's life should be a challenge to every one of us in this room? Let me propose that to you in two ways. I think that Rahab's life was a challenge to every Canaanite that lived in Jericho. She lived in a pagan land that didn't have a Lifegate Baptist church, didn't have a Bible preacher like Brother Dietrich saying, Thus saith the Lord every Sunday and every Wednesday. As a matter of fact, she didn't hear a whole lot She basically, from verse number 11, she hears in verse number 10 that that God dried up the Red Sea, that God beat two established kings in in an utterly powerful way. 
And by hearing those things about God, her heart was turned and she said, You know what? She said, I'm going to place my faith in Jehovah. Now here's the other, part, other side of that coin. I think every Canaanite knew these facts. I don't know if they got their news from the Jericho Times or what, but they're listening and they're like, wow, they say this Jehovah dried up the Red Sea. They say this Jehovah beat up Sihon and Og. They all heard the same thing, but there were two totally different reactions. The vast majority, we don't care, but in the heart of Rahab, she's like, ooh, there's something to that. You know when I'm preaching, uh, this, I'm gonna let uh, I'm gonna let loose one of my preacher secrets here. That we preachers, we're like you hear magicians; they don't tell the secrets to their tricks. We preachers sometimes we don't divulge certain things. But I'm gonna tell you: Did you know that while I'm preaching, that we actually see what people are doing while we're preaching? Did you know that? Did you know that we can actually tell who's bored and who's not? When you're sleeping, we can tell whether it was like a I'm tired sleep or I didn't take my insulin sleep, you know? Or I'm a bored sleep. The bored sleep is like this. And you look so ugly when you do it. But you know what amazes me? And I'm sure Pastor Dietrich has seen this. You can be preaching the same message and get two totally different reactions. You've got somebody who's sitting on the edge of their seat. They're about to fall out and they're like... And you've got somebody else and they're just rolling their eyes back waiting for the paint to dry, you know? That's exactly what happens. Everybody gets the same message. Here's one who says, I believe in Jehovah. And everybody else is like... Ugh. Her life was a challenge to every Canaanite. But you know what? I believe her life was not only a challenge to every Canaanite. I believe that her life was a challenge to every Israelite who lived on the outside. And here's why. Rahab did not have the advantage that those Israelites had. You say, what advantage do those Israelites have? Those Israelites had, they, they had teaching. They had Sabbaths. They perhaps had prophets. They had priests. They had, they had the book of the law. They had Jewish history. Here they had all kinds of things that they were taught. They had a lot of light, but here Rahab had very little light. Rahab had a little sliver Red Sea, Sihon, Og, and that's about it. And you know what amazes me? Is that Rahab did a lot with the little light that she had. You know why that ought to convict us? I'll tell you why. Because I say to every person in this room, you've got 66 books. Some of you have been raised in church all of your life. Some of you have memorized parts of Scripture. You've heard lots of preaching or you've been in church for a considerable portion of your life. You know what i found? It's not so much how much light you have as much as what do you do with the light that you have. And one of my biggest fears at Ambassador is you get some people that have a lot of light but they do very little with it. Can I tell you to whom much is given, much will be required. Listen to me, if you're in this room and you've been exposed to the Word of God, I promise you, you could learn much from Rahab. She appreciated the light that she had. What about you? What have you done with the light that you have? So number one, her conversion. Number two, her challenge. Number three, I want you to see her courage. This is where the storyline gets a little interesting. In verse number three, the king of Jericho sends to Rahab and says, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they come to search out all the country. Can you imagine me? The government comes to her and they says, We want the enemy and we want him now. Now this woman did two things. Number one, she took these spies into her home. And then number two, she covers for them.
She had hid them under flax. And notice what she says to them. She said, there came men unto me, but I went not. I, I don't know where they're at. And then she says, you know, if you go out there and run fast enough, you might catch them. Now, let me just deal with the most controversial part of that first. Somebody says, well, it's obvious that Rahab lied. All right? Now, you can have a couple of different explanations of it, but there's one thing that I know for sure. Some people say, well, did God bless her lie or was God pleased with that? And some people would say, well, it was a time of war. It was a time of deception and therefore it was permissible. When somebody asks me, what do you think? I say, here's where I land on it. Never one time in the Bible do I ever read about God blessing her lie, but I will tell you, God, you do see in the Bible blesses her faith. I can say that without doubt. That's how she gets into Hebrews chapter 11. And so you can do one of two things tonight. You can go out of here and you can just go back and forth in your mind and say, boy, you know, does this, a, does this help me make, make a legitimate reason for lying? Or Instead of living in that swamp, what I would encourage you to do is to understand that God honored this lady for her faith and it took an immense amount of courage for her to take the enemies into her house. Now women, this ought to be the time where you lift your head up a little bit and you say, I'll tell you, you can learn some courage from us women. I mean, she basically takes the enemy of Jericho and lets them stay in her home. That woman had an amazing boldness and she did not do it out of expediency. A lot of times we serve God out of convenience. Well, it just happens to be convenient or if it suits me that... Listen, this woman put her neck on the line. And she stood alone. There was no support group in Jericho. You know, have you ever heard people, they say, well, if I just had people around me to encourage me to do right. Listen, I'm all for positive peer pressure, but here's the thing. If you live your life by peer pressure, your life is going to be governed by the people you're with rather than principle, ultimately. And you're as good as they're good and you're as bad as they're bad. And when you choose to live that way, I promise you, one of these days you're going to get in the wrong group and you're going to do the wrong thing. But she didn't, have low, she didn't have Christians anonymous that met every Tuesday night and, and some uh, you know, hide out and they said, well, you know, we're trying to stand for Jehovah and this pagan. She had none of that. She was it. And if Rahab could be bold in Jericho, why, and with no support, why can't we be bold for God in the day in which we live? This woman risked her life and some of us can't even swallow our pride. We'd learn a lot from Rahab if we'd just sit still and listen. Her faith motivated her to risk her life. That's the bottom line. Let me ask you a question. What does your faith motivate you to do? Does it motivate you to be a witness for Christ? Does it motivate you to step out and to live for God? Even at times when it may not be popular. Here was a woman that had great courage. She took in the spies even at the risk of her own life. Today, Brother Dietrich and I, we spent time with a couple and they're spending their lives and Ivory Coast is where they want to go. And you know, it's without modern convenience. And uh, I guess there's any risk when you go to a foreign country, but it's not like they're going to a place where there's martyrdom. But yet, these young people are stepping forward. What has motivated them to give the gospel in a land that doesn't have modern conveniences, in a land that may not be friendly to what they're teaching? It's their faith. But the same faith that motivates missionaries ought to motivate every church member. And here... Rahab was a new Christian, if I could say it that way, and she had more courage than maybe some of us who've been saved for years. So number one, we see her conversion. Number two, we see her challenge. Number three, we see her courage. But number four, I want you to see her concern. It's interesting. Somehow, some way, I don't know how, okay? 
But somehow, some way, Rahab knew that God was going to destroy Jericho. And the reason I know that is because after she makes her great confession, she said, Now therefore I pray you, swear by, unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you'll show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token, and that ye will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren. She said, Listen, when judgment comes, please save us. Here it is at this early part in Rahab's faith that she demonstrates a concern for her family. That she demonstrates a concern for those who are close to her heart. I'm challenged by that. You know, if you knew that the judgment was coming and you'd been Rahab, maybe you'd said, listen, I need to pour out and pull out my 401k from the bank because since it's going to crash, I might as well get my cash and go. Rahab's concern wasn't, now listen, when you come and destroy this place, please don't ruin my chariot. I just paid it off. <laughs> Rahab, was, it wasn't about material things. Do you know what was on Rahab's heart? When she knew that this judgment was coming, it was her own family, her people, and she prayed. She said, please, I want them to be spared. You know, there's a lesson for us to be learned in that. Because I'm afraid Rahab had a greater burden for her loved ones than maybe some of us in this room. Maybe it's been some time since we've been struck by the fact that judgment is coming. The Bible says that it is appointed unto man once to die. After this, the judgment. Every one of us, we have an appointment here. It's an appointment with death. Our loved ones have an appointment from death for, with death. When's the last time the thought ever occurred to you to be concerned for their souls, to be concerned for their well-being, and your heart said, Boy, if there's anybody that I'd want to see spared, it's my loved ones, it's my mom, my dad, my brothers and my sisters, and all that they have. This woman had a great concern for her loved ones. Several years ago, it's been many years ago now, I was preaching out in eastern North Carolina and I was preaching in a church in Alliance, North Carolina. But I was staying in a prophet's chamber at a, at a church and it was a house that was in a neighborhood. You couldn't tell that it was part of the church property. And my wife and I are staying in that house during the day and my wife looks outside and she says, uh-oh. I said, what's that, honey? She said, look, the Mormons are visiting here in the neighborhood. And I looked and sure enough, there are two guys wearing white shirts, black pants, bicycles, elder badges, and they were the Mormons. And my wife knew what that meant. She knew that they were going to knock on my door and she knew when they knocked on my door I was going to talk to them and sure enough we just waited and they made their way and finally they knocked on our door and I remember stepping to the door and my wife just gave me that look of what are you going to do. And uh, I stepped out on that doorstep. Now let me just remind you of something that for many Mormons whenever they graduate from high school they'll take a two-year mission that's often self-funded and they go to either a foreign country or a different state or they go to some place that's out of the ordinary and there they propagate a false gospel. Not the gospel of Jesus Christ but the gospel of Joseph Smith and there's a world of difference. And so these two men knocked on my door and uh, I always know this, when you see them, you know that one's got his act together. He's been the one who's been trained up one side and down the other. Usually the other one is the trainee. He's the one who's on duty, he's watching. And So anyway, uh, they started talking. I just stepped out on the porch. I didn't say I'm a Baptist preacher or I know the Bible. I just sat there and they told me their spill. And the one did all the talking. He told me everything about uh, all the introductory stuff about Joseph Smith, Book of Mormon, and talked about eternity and such. And I sat there and listened, and I just said, Well, you know, this guy over here, he hasn't said a word. I said, Do you mind if I ask him a question? He said, Sure, go right ahead. 
And I looked at that fellow and I said, young man, if you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven or hell? And when I asked him that question, he stuttered and he stammered. He about swallowed his teeth. And so once he did that, I just continued talking to him and I gave him the gospel. How that Jesus Christ died on the cross. How that we're all sinners and that without God we are, we are headed towards judgment. And it's not works, it's not righteousness that we have done, but it's according to His mercy that we're saved. And about halfway through my, or most of the way through my spill, then the other guy steps in and said, that's, that's enough. He said, we're going to leave. I said, well, wait a second, I'm not finished. He said, that's enough, we're going to leave. And those two fellows walked off our porch that day and while I certainly didn't appreciate the message that they had, I'll tell you one thing that many Baptists can't put a, could have put a candle to them is this, is that their, their dedication. What would you think would happen? And I'm not suggesting this, but if every Baptist, there, when they graduated from high school, they had to go two years on a mission field. We can't even get them to go for one week. And I wouldn't be so much hard to blame them as much as maybe us as parents and us as leaders. We're the ones that perhaps has failed them the most. Folks, Rahab had a concern for her family. I want to ask you, when's the last time you've had a concern for somebody besides yourself? This woman teaches us a lot. But not only do you see her curse, but two last things I want you to see, or her, uh, ch her challenge and then to see her concern. But the next thing that I want you to see is her curse. Now here's the curse. Do you know that when you read her name in the New Testament, at least twice you'll find this tag with her name, the harlot. By faith, the harlot Rahab. You find that on several occasions. Now, why is that? Rahab made some mistakes in her past, and we find that it trails her all the way into the New Testament. I really don't think that's God's way of just saying, well, when you mess up, uh, you know, you mess up, and I'll never forget it. I don't believe it's so much talking about the memory of God as much as it reminds us about the memory of man. I'm glad that God forgives. But I'm going to tell you, when you make a mistake, man has a, hard, a lot harder time forgetting it. You know what I learned from Rahab? I learned you better be careful about the things that you do earlier on in life because they can mark you through the rest of your life. You know, I'm 48 years old. I'm soon to be 49. And I've tried to live for the Lord for these last 30-some years since I've been saved. But I'm going to tell you, I can take 48 years of life and throw it out the door with one bad decision. And instead of being known about an evangelist who's, as an evangelist who's preached the gospel for 30 years, I'll be known as the preacher who blew it. You can be marked. You can be marked by one major mistake if you're not careful. You say, well, that's not fair. Listen to me. I'll tell you what's not fair is when you don't listen when God's trying to warn you. That's not right. That's not good. Uh, Brother Dietrich and I went to a baseball game. He told me it was a rare occasion for the Cardinals to win. So I was glad to, to uh, be there for that special occasion. And, uh, but I do, I love baseball, and uh, for me it's really an oddity, but being from the South, somehow I became a New York Mets fan in the mid-80s. Please forgive me for it, it's not, I'm not an Atlanta Braves fan, but I remember as a kid in 1986, uh, that was the year the New, New York Mets beat the Boston Red Sox in seven games in the World Series. But I'll never forget Game 6. Game six, it was the, towards the end of the game and the Mets were one out away from losing game six and losing the World Series. All, all it, one more out and that was it. And the Mets were gone and the Red Sox would break the curse. 
And I remember I was sitting on my living room floor watching this game and an outfielder by the name of Mookie Wilson for the New York Mets dug into the batter's box and I said, this game's over with. Mookie's got a really cool name, but his bat's not doing a whole lot these days. Long story short, Mookie Wilson hits a slow dribbler to a bow-legged first baseman named Bill Buckner. Bill Buckner in his prime was a stellar defensive fielder. He was a good hitter. He was a great ball player. And at that moment, Mookie Wilson hit that ball and without, I don't know how to explain it, but the ball rolled in between Bill Buckner's legs and went out into the field. And the New York Mets tied the game, won game six, and came back to win game seven. And Bill Buckner never lived it down. I remember I was up in New England one time and a young man found out that I was a Mets fan. He said, Brother Bill, he said, did you hear that Bill Buckner tried to take his life? And I, I you know, I mean, after something happened, oh, so many death threats, I wouldn't have been surprised at that. He said, did you know that Bill Buckner tried to take his life? I said, no, I didn't. Really? He said, yeah. He said he jumped in front of a bus, but don't worry, it went between his legs. That's all they ever remember about Bill Buckner. He's dead now. Actually, in my office, I have an autographed picture of Mookie Wilson and Bill Buckner signed on that very play where that happened. But even to this day, that's what the man was known for. And you know what? The man at times hit over 300. The man in his prime was a stellar defensive person on the ball field, and that's all people remember about him. Now let me tell you what happens. You take any person in here. There's no person excluded. You can live a lot of your life in the right circumstances. Go out and blow it living for the devil and I'm telling you it haunts you the rest of your life. That was a curse to Rahab. But the last thing that I want you to see is I want you to see her crown. And I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 1 to see it. It's bad enough when you make a mistake and you're branded by that mistake. But can I tell you something that's wonderful about God? You can take a person that has a horrible past and by God's grace He can do some amazing things in their future. I want you to notice with me Matthew chapter 1. Here's one of the, the more exciting parts of the Scripture. It's called genealogy. <laughs> I say that tongue in cheek. I want you to notice with me Matthew chapter 1 verse 5. It says, And Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab. Now by the way, this is in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And here it tells us, that a little baby named Boaz was born to a man and his wife Rahab. Now you want to know something neat? Here was a woman that was used and abused by men. And you know what I believe happened after she placed her faith in God? She found out, you know what, God has a plan. That plan is called marriage. And everything within that plan is wonderful. And you know what God did? God gave her a husband and God gave her a child. Instead of waking up every day wondering who is next, she has a steady companion by her side that loves her and that treats her well in which she can have security. And now she has a child. Listen, we could stop there and say, man, that is wonderful. A woman who had no clue of what God's plan would be for her life and now she has a husband and a child. Wow, that's great! But it doesn't stop there. It says, And Boaz begat Obed of Ruth. 
you know what? Rahab not only had children, but she had the next greatest thing, and maybe even the greater thing by the testament of some grandparents. She had grandchildren. I'm not there yet. I have a son who's married. He's just now talking about children, and we're just sort of waiting for that to come. But, you know, I've heard grandparents say, boy, we sure like to see those headlights coming, and then those taillights going. You know, like, let's take them and spoil them and send them home. But, you know, most grandparents, it used to be grandparents would pull out of their purse a wallet and say, let me show you pictures of my grandparents now, or my grandchildren. Now it really humors me to watch a lady take out her iPhone and say, let me show you a picture. And she's got about 300 gigabytes of pictures that she just scrolls through right there and shows you. So do you understand what's happened? God has given her a child and a husband. God has given her grandchildren. And then it says later, And Obed begat Jesse. So now her grandchildren have children. And before it's over with, guess what? She has a great, 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 somewhere along in their grandchild, his name is David. You want to talk about blowing your mind? I mean, this woman was just like on the refuge, refuse pile of Jericho. Places her faith in God, leaves her, that lifestyle, follows Jehovah, and she is like the great, great, or great, great, great grandmother of King David. He's like the greatest of all kings. I know we're all proud of our children and maybe some of you are proud of your grandchildren, but boy, if you knew you had a great, great, great grandchild who was like the President of the United States, you'd be, you'd be quick to point that out. Oh, let me tell you what, my grandson, he's a senator. He's a pre- Listen, hers was the king. This woman is a part of a royal bloodline. A woman who is known by her past in the eyes of many and God lifts her up. But it doesn't stop there. Many generations later, there was one born greater than David. His name, Jesus. And Rahab's a part of that. Let me tell you what that teaches us. I don't know what you were before you got saved. I don't know what you did before you trusted Christ. But I can promise you this. No matter what you were, I'll tell you, as a child of God, never cease to be amazed at what God can do in and through you when you just follow Him. The devil wants to remind you about what you used to be. The devil wants to remind you about the past that scarred you. But my friend, don't take your eyes off of what God can do in you and through you. What a crown. What an amazing thing. Do you understand tonight? God took a woman who was an immoral mess in rags and took her to riches with a faith in God and a determination to do right. And God can do that for any person under the sound of my voice tonight. May the Lord help us to learn lessons from the life of Rahab.